Identity politics does not offer an alternative truth to the Bible, but it does point to people's experiences, which sometimes might help us to see things that are in our Bible a little better, a little more clearly. Let me, let me give you an illustration. I'm sure I must have read Psalm 55, 21 a number of times over the years. Here it is. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. But I don't know that I ever gave much thought to that particular verse, at least until one day or over a period of time, I found myself involved in a marital counseling situation with a, an a verbally abusive husband and abused wife. Now with me and the other pastors involved in this, this man's speech was smooth as butter. It was softer than oil. So frankly, it was easy to believe him. His wife would describe how awful things were at home, and, but then we would listen to him and say, well, what, what him, really? Uh, meanwhile, this wife knew all too well that According to the verse, there was war in her husband's heart. And that his words were not soft oil, they were drawn swords. And it took the pastors a while to figure out that out and how bad it was. Gratefully, by God's grace, we eventually did. And I remember one day a counselor showed her Psalm 55, 21, and she could say, that's it. God gets it. Even when my pastors don't get it, God gets it. And through hearing her experience, that verse actually helps me now understand the perspective of an abused or oppressed woman. In a way, frankly, until I'd gone through that experience, I just didn't. So that experience helped me understand my Bible better. My Bible had resources to interpret that experience. And identity politics, I'm saying, can be an un uh, unexpected ally in those kinds of ways. It helps us to view more of life than maybe we viewed before through a biblical lens. Again, let me give you four subpoints to how it's an unexpected ally. Number one, it's an unexpected ally because it reminds us of what the Bible teaches about the pervasiveness of sin. Let me remind you of a few verses from Scripture about sin. Psalm 51, verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Or Isaiah 64, verse 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Or Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I confess I am a little surprised when Christians get defensive around some of the topics highlighted by identity politics. Because, as these three verses teach us, our doctrine of sin affirms that we're sinful at birth. Uh, that we sin pervasively. Not that we're as bad as we can be, but that it touches every area of our lives and that our sin deceives us. Uh, listen again, Psalm 51, verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now, I don't want to charge that little white boy in the suburbs eating a four-square meal with racism, racism per se, uh, but if he is indeed sinful at birth, is it not least worth considering the possibility that he'll structure his life in order to give advantage to himself and become sinfully partial toward whatever groups he occupies? Uh, from his high school versus other high schools, from the nation he lives in to other nations, to his, his socioeconomic class compared to other classes, to his skin color versus other skin colors. Uh, to me, that seems like a pretty basic application of Psalm 51. Or, or Isaiah 64 again. All of us have become like one who's unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. So when a critical race theorist comes along and says that white people pass laws like the Civil Rights Acts, not out of uh, altruism, but out of self-interest. Well, on the one hand, I want to affirm common grace and the fact that non-Christians certainly can love and certainly do desire to do justice. But I also want to affirm total depravity and say, yeah, of course. Even our righteous acts are filthy rags. Changing laws does not change hearts. That's basic Christianity. So we can pat ourselves on the back and say, hey, the laws are equal. But you can also understand why minority folk looking around, noticing how whites still huddle in the same neighborhoods and have 13 times the average household wealth than the average African-American, uh, you can understand why minority folk might say, have things changed that much? Now, you might say, well, the sort of state can't change hearts. And that's certainly true. But my concern here, my concern in this talk is the Christian's heart and the life of the church. Isaiah 64, 6 should change 
Christian hearts. Uh, we as Christians should be willing to admit that maybe, just maybe, we are more self-interested and less loving than we think. Even as we give ourselves doctors, uh, give ourselves doctor's notes that say racism free. Now let me be clear about this. I'm not asking you to think about government policy, at least not in the first instance. I'm asking you to think about the posture of our hearts as Christians. So not policy, but posture of heart. That's the conversation I'm trying to have here. And friends, identity politics is an unexpected ally because it asks us, for at least a moment, to view people within their group identity and to ask whether they've been oppressed or at least under-recognized, under-loved, under-affirmed, under-encouraged, under-promoted in comparison to people who look like us. It's an ally because it reminds us that we're sinful from birth, Psalm 51. It wears camouflage, Isaiah 64. And it deceives us, Jeremiah 17. Elements of identity politics, that is to say, helps us to affirm the very doctrine of sin that we affirm. 